Jeremiah, a weeping prophet to a sinful nation. This is part two, and this is a study of the very first part of the book of Jeremiah, where we see the foundation being laid by God to Jeremiah for what he was to preach and say to the Israel people in Jerusalem and the Judah kingdom. Jeremiah's call of God to preach to Jerusalem began in about 626 B.C., and he preached for 40 years until the city of Jerusalem was destroyed and the people taken into the Babylonian captivity. Let's review a little from last week in this first chapter, starting in verse 4. Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee, and before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. And he told him to go to the Israel people. But before he did, then the Lord put forth his hand, verse 9, and touched my mouth, and the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. See, I have this day set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down and to destroy and to throw down to build and to plant. Quite a job for one man. Not only was he to bring about some sort of a destruction by his preaching and taking the word of God to Israel, but praise God, he was to build and to plant also. Then in verse 14, Then the Lord said unto me, Out of the north, and evil shall break forth upon all the inhabitants of the land. For lo, I will call all the families of the kingdoms of the north, saith the Lord, and they shall come, and they shall set every one his throne at the entering of the gates of Jerusalem, and against all the walls thereof round about, and against all the cities of Judah. And I will utter my judgments against them, touching all their wickedness, who have forsaken me, and have burned incense unto other gods, and worshipped the works of their own hand. God was going to bring an enemy nation against this Judah kingdom, against this Israel nation, not because of the sins of the other nations, but because of the sins of Israel. And let's face this, this is the truth of all of God's word, that his judgment and chastisement is brought only upon the Israel people. Whosoever the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. And that's the great hope that we have in this. Now this was to come against Israel, and I believe we have to some extent the same situation today. God is raising up what we know as heathen, antichrist, communist nations, And they obviously are preparing to come against our nation. Now, in spite of all of the propaganda that we receive, that we somehow can talk our way out of this, or if we are nice to them, and if we trade with them, and if we send them aid, any person with at least some knowledge of world events and the aims of world communism know they intend to come against this country. Now, here in the old Judah kingdom, God said, I am raising up a nation from the north, and I'm going to send it against you because of your sin and iniquity. Verse 17, Thou therefore gird up thy loins, and arise, and speak unto them all that I command thee. Be not dismayed at their faces, lest I confound thee before them. Speak all that I command thee. This is the one crying need in America and the rest of our nations of Israel today to hear God's word. Now, we hear a lot of other things, but God sent Jeremiah to a nation that was in danger of destruction by an enemy power, and he said, I'm sending you there to speak all that I command thee. Speak my word to Israel. For behold, I have made thee this day a defense city, and an iron pillar, and brazen walls against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, against the princes thereof, against the priests thereof, and against the people of the land. What a ministry Jeremiah had. Not a very good one, or a very happy one, it seems. And of course, that's why Jeremiah was called the weeping prophet. He was sent there against the people of the land. He wasn't sent there for them. He was sent there to preach against them. What would the people do? And they shall fight against thee. 
but they shall not prevail against thee, for I am with thee, saith the Lord, to deliver thee. In chapter 2, he reminded the Israel people of the covenant, and then he asked them why they had turned away from him. And then in verse 7, God says to them, I brought you into a plentiful country to eat the fruit thereof and the goodness thereof. But when ye entered, ye defiled my land and made mine heritage an abomination. Now, as we've mentioned before, the parallel between ancient Israel and America is so striking, it is amazing that all of the people who read the Bible do not see it, but they do not. And yet we have had the same thing happen to us. We have been brought by God Almighty into a goodly land, and we have despoiled this land. We have polluted it, and we have made God's heritage an abomination. Now, Israel is God's heritage, and yet this Israel people has become a filthy, sinful, wicked people in what was and could have been, and still is to some extent, the greatest, most God-blessed nation upon the face of the earth. You know, we read of some of the other nations of the earth and all of their troubles and trials and tribulation. About two-thirds of the people of the earth live with the specter of famine haunting them every year. Millions of people die of diseases associated with lack of food. And yet here in America, we have so much of these things that we waste them. We do not understand why we even have them. And God said to the Judah kingdom through Jeremiah, I brought you into a plentiful country and to eat the fruit and the goodness thereof. But you defiled the land and made mine heritage an abomination. And who are the greatest culprits? Listen to this. The priest said not, Where is the Lord? And they that handle the law knew me not. The pastors also transgressed against me. And the prophets prophesied by Baal and walked after things that do not profit. Who is the culprit in this land of Israel? The clergy, the professing teachers of the Bible. And that was true in ancient Israel. They transgress against God, they teach Baal doctrine, and they corrupt themselves and Israel. Verse 19, Thine own wickedness shall correct thee, and thy backsliding shall reprove thee. Know therefore and see that it is an evil thing and bitter that thou hast forsaken the Lord thy God, and that my fear is not in thee, saith the Lord God of hosts. It is a terrible thing to contemplate, but our chastening will be those things which we have turned to and turned against God. The very things that we have turned to will be the judgments that God will bring upon us. And let me give you an example here, or a few examples so you'll understand what God means in this verse when he says, Thine own wickedness shall correct thee. We won't punish murderers and thieves, so what happens? We live in fear of our lives, of murderers and thieves in our cities. We won't obey God's marriage laws, so we've millions of broken homes and a sad and despondent people and an epidemic of venereal disease. We won't obey God's economic laws, so we are becoming slaves to the money lenders and the usurers. We won't obey God's farming and sanitation laws, so our food is not health-giving, and our environment, our air, water, and soil is being polluted. We won't obey God's command to segregate, separate ourselves from other races, so we are plagued with interracial hatred and violence against our own people by alien races in our own land. And we won't obey God's laws for government, so our government is becoming our enemy and our destroyer. It is true that our own wickedness will eventually correct us. These things that we have turned and done will eventually bring us to a point where we will have to turn to God or be destroyed. Now, Israel in America has not seen that yet. We still think we can do these things and continue in this corruption and say, well, that's just other people doing that. That has no effect on me. Well, I beg to tell you that God is speaking to the entire nation of Israel, as we'll see later. Verse 20, For of old time I have broken thy yoke and burst thy bands, and thou saidest I will not transgress. 
when upon every high hill and under every green tree thou wanderest playing the harlot. God has given us the way to life and liberty. But we have turned from that. We have turned to other gods, other ideologies, and other heathen religions. And I mean to other heathen religions. I think I mentioned to you that one of the uh, followers of Buddha is going to run for the mayor of the city of Phoenix. And if I recall just recently, either the city of San Francisco or the state of California, I don't remember which, actually elected as a chaplain a Buddhist priest. You think we haven't turned to other gods? Yes, we not only have many individuals, but we are doing it on an official basis in this land. So God's condemnation of ancient Israel certainly fits us today. Yet I had planted thee a noble vine, holy a right seed. How then art thou turned into the degenerate plant of a strange vine unto me? We know that America was planted as a faithful Christian people less than 300 or about 300 years ago. For though thou wash thee with nitre and take thee much soap, yet thine iniquity is marked before me, saith the Lord God. How canst thou say, I am not polluted? I have not gone after Balaam. See thy way in the valley. Know what thou hast done. Thou art a swift dromedary traversing her ways. We have had false doctrines, and we have had the doctrines of Baal preached so long in America that when we preach God's truth and tell people that they are following evil and strange doctrines, they turn around and tell us, well, we're crazy. We're worshiping Jesus Christ. And yet the things which they believe and the things which they follow are so strange when you compare them to God, and yet they do exactly what God said the people in Jerusalem would do to Jeremiah. They would fight him when he came there with the truth. And they say, no, we are not worshiping Baal. What did God say to Jeremiah in chapter 1 and verse 19? He says, they shall fight against thee. And they are doing that in America today. They are actually fighting against the truth. And they say, we are not polluted. We are not worshiping Baal. Some of you folks who might be a little new to this ministry, it's getting along about that time of the year, I would suggest that if you have not done so, that you read our booklet, Is Christmas Christian? I did this as a series of radio broadcasts some years ago, and we put it in print. In the several years before that, I had been collecting information about this great American holiday called the Christmas holiday. And I, among other people that I know here, I was brought up in a family that celebrated Christmas. We always had a tree in Santa Claus. In our school, we had an annual Christmas program, and we had all of these trappings of Christmas. Well, I was rather startled to find that it was very easy to prove that most of the rituals which America goes through from October, November, and December in relation to Christmas fit the worship of Baal. It is actually a religion. And these are the trappings and rituals of an ancient antichrist religion, Baal worship. And uh, I've distributed this. I've preached about it on the radio. And uh, I have shown that many of these things which we do are actually blasphemy to God Almighty. And I have people write to me and say, Well, Pastor Emery, you are wrong. There's nothing wrong with Christmas. These little children, the little children enjoy it so much, and so on. Well, my friend, you take a look at that book and you'll find that millions, millions of Americans go through the rituals of the worship of Baal and millions of them do not even know what they're doing. Yes, there is Baal worship in America. And God says here, to these Israel people, how canst thou say, I am not polluted, I have not gone after Balaam? And they do that today. They say, no, we're not worshiping Balaam. But God says, see thy way in the valley, know what thou hast done. In other words, check, inspect, study, find out what it is you do and what you think and what you believe. See whether it is right or whether it is wrong. 
He says, Thou art a swift dromedary traversing her ways, a wild ass used to the wilderness, that snuffeth up the wind at her pleasure, in her occasion who can turn her away. All they that seek her will not weary themselves. In her month they shall find her. And I suspect in that verse that God is comparing the Israel people to the wild ass who will mate with any jackass that comes along. And I sometimes wonder if we aren't that kind of a people. It sounds rather strange for a minister to say such a thing. But if you will study God's Word, and if you will study history, and if you will study what is taught in the churches of America, you will be amazed to find out that most of the people in this land actually follow the religion of Balaam. They have done what Paul warned them not to do. They have turned to another gospel, to another Jesus, to another God. And I would say right here, this rapture doctrine that these people have held on to is one of those things. If the Bible does not teach that the Christians will be raptured from the earth, and yet people believe that their God is going to do that, then they are doing what? They are worshiping another God. They may call Him Jesus Christ. They may take this Bible to their church. They may read verses from it. But if they believe their God is going to do something which the God of the Bible says He's not going to do, they are worshiping another God. Verse 25, Withhold thy foot from being unshod, and thy throat from thirst. But thou saidest, There is no hope. No, for I have loved strangers, and after them will I go. I know you've had this happen to you. I've had people write me letters and tell me, Well, Pastor Emery, I like your preaching, but you're not going to take the rapture away from me. They even unconsciously will admit that it probably isn't true, but they're going to hold on to it. And that's what God accused these people. They've loved strangers, and after them will I go. They have false doctrine, and they will not give it up. Verse 26, As the thief is ashamed when he is found, so is the house of Israel ashamed. They, their kings, their princes, and their priests, and their prophets. Quite a charge there. The thief is ashamed of what? Of getting caught. He's not ashamed of what he's done. He's ashamed of getting caught. And God, in effect, is saying, that's what your people are like. They are not ashamed of what they've done, your kings, your princes, your priests, and your prophets. They're only ashamed if they get caught at it. And uh, some of you have had the opportunity to know that we have caught some of these preachers with their lies, and in private conversation they will admit that what they are preaching is a lie, and then they go right on preaching it. What's that mean? They're not ashamed of it like the thief. Once he's released, he's going to go back and steal again. And they go back to the people and lie again, saying to a stock, Thou art my father, and to a stone, Thou hast brought me forth. For they have turned their back unto me and not their face. But in the time of their trouble they will say, Arise and save us. You know, you can say all you want about the heathen, but God sure has Israel's number, doesn't he? They'll do all of these filthy, wicked things, but God says, I know when you get in trouble, you will turn to me. Now here's God's answer. You just think on this. But where are thy gods that thou hast made thee? Let them arise if they can save thee in the time of thy trouble. For according to the number of thy cities are thy gods, O Judah. It appears that in that ancient land of Judah, in the area around Jerusalem, they had a lot of different denominations there too, didn't they? He said, you have a God for every city in your land. I know when you get in trouble, I know when this enemy nation from the north comes against you, you are going to turn to me and ask me to save you. But I am going to say to you, where are the gods you have made? Let them come and save you. And God only knows 
how many of the people who believe this unscriptural rapture doctrine as these days of darkness and tribulation come upon us are going to arrive at a point where they're going to be praying that God will come and save them from the tribulation and take them off to heaven as they thought their God was going to do. And God's going to say, what are you calling on me for? Why don't you call on the God you believed in? The one you trusted, the one you made for yourself. Verse 29, Wherefore will ye plead with me? Yea, all have transgressed against me, saith the Lord. In vain have I smitten your children. They received no correction. Your own sword hath devoured your prophets like a destroying lion. Now, we've not come to the place in our nation and in our time where ministers and prophets are being put to death. But this did happen less than three centuries ago in Europe. It's not ancient history, it's recent history. And if the enemies of God's people Israel have their way, we may see that happening in this land again. And this is an accusation of ancient Israel here by God. He said, you've killed your own priests and prophets that I sent to you. Your own sword hath devoured your prophets like a destroying lion. Here's God's command. O generation, see ye the word of the Lord. Now think with me just a moment here what Jeremiah has said so far. God has put the words in Jeremiah's heart and mind and mouth and he's gone to them and he said, You are a people in transgression. Number two, I am going to raise up a strong enemy nation and send them against you to punish you for those transgressions. The transgressions being primarily worshiping other gods. And as I said, when we believe and teach doctrines which are not in this Bible, we have made other gods unto ourselves. This is what they had done. And then he said, when they come, you will say, arise and save us. And God's answer is, wherefore will ye plead with me? Ye all have transgressed against me, saith the Lord, in verse 31. O generation, see ye the word of the Lord. In other words, God is saying, I'm not going to come and save you. What I'm going to tell you to do is to hear my word. Now, I don't know what it's going to take. I know it's going to take more than preaching. I know some good preachers in the kingdom identity movement. And most of them agree with me that I don't care how much we preach and how many radio stations we go on and how good of preachers we try to be, we are not going to bring Israel to God until Israel is in so much trouble, they're going to turn and then God's going to say, all right, now maybe you listen to my word. And after all, that's all that Jeremiah was sent to the Judah kingdom to do, was to take God's word to the people. He warned them, of course, as in the very beginning, and he warned them in other places of the Babylonian kingdom, the Chaldeans who were going to come against them. But he repeated over and over, Hear ye the word of the Lord. And of course that's our message today. And that's my message. And I guess as long as I mention the people who believed in the rapture, I better repeat to them that there's going to come a time when they're going to be praying for that rapture. And the only answer they're going to get is God is going to make a way for some preacher and they'll hear that preacher saying, Hear the word of the Lord. They're not going to go. They're going to stay right here and hear God's word. All right. O generation, see ye the word of the Lord. Have I been a wilderness unto Israel, a land of darkness? In other words, has God been darkness to His people? No, this Word is light. This Word is a way of life. This Word gives divine standards for living in righteousness and the blessings of God upon the earth. It's not a way of darkness. 
Wherefore say my people, we are Lord, we will come no more unto thee. Can a maid forget her ornaments, or a bride her attire? Yet my people have forgotten me days without number. Yes, we remember everything else. You know, we carry on our lives. And if we can't remember things well for our daily lives or our work, our occupation or our family, we write it down so we're sure we get it done. But we forget God days without number. Why trimmest thou thy way to seek love? Therefore hast thou also taught the wicked ones thy ways. And to some extent we have. We have even sent missionaries all over the world in the last generation to tell them the same false doctrines that we're teaching in our churches. Now, some of the heathen refuse to hear these things. Some of you know John Lance. He and his wife attended our church for some time. They're stationed over in Germany now. And uh, in case you hadn't heard this story before, perhaps I should repeat it again. John was stationed in Japan for three years, and he was a young Baptist, uh, very diligent in his church. And so while he was over there, he got in contact with the Baptist missionaries in the city he was in in Japan. And many weekends he would go with them and be with them to help them conduct their services and also to go out on the streets of that city and preach to the Japanese. And, of course, their main theme was that which the Baptists teach, that if you don't want to go to hell and burn forever in fire, then you'd better come and accept Christ and we'll baptize you and so on. And they tell it a hundred different ways, but that's the general theme of their preaching. And John said that these Japanese would answer him, well, your God... uh, says that he's going to burn all of my ancestors in fire forever and ever and all of my parents and my grandparents who've died well they're going to be burned and tortured forever and ever what do I want your God for so apparently the Japanese had enough sense to reject this God that was being preached by the Baptists well my friends this God being preached by the Baptists with that hellfire and burning in pain and torture forever and ever is not the God of the Bible that is another God that they have made, and they've taken him over to the heathen. Well, some of the heathen believe them, some don't. But anyway, they have turned, or we have turned, and tried to go out and teach the wicked, even, of these false things. Therefore hast thou also taught the wicked ones thy ways. Also in thy skirts is found the blood of the souls of the poor innocents. I have not found it by secret search, but upon all these. Yes, we are guilty of innocent blood. And it is the false teaching of the clergy and the acceptance of their lies by the people that has resulted in hundreds of thousands of deaths in wars which we should never have fought with disease, drugs, and immorality bringing destruction upon our people, our criminals on the loose. I talked to the chairman of a ministerial committee here in Phoenix one time about drugs. And I suggested to him that they follow God's law and whip the offender. He agreed with me that it would work and he said, we can't do that, we're not under the law. It would work, but we can't use God's law. They actually admit that God's law will work and then refuse to use it. So they are guilty of innocent blood. We have the Negro who is an alien race in our land now being transported by our tax money into our schools and they're stabbing and killing our white Anglo-Saxon children in schools all over America and it's getting worse because we refuse to obey God's word. And we now condone, and this is pretty close to right, the murder of half of the babies conceived in America every year. Can you imagine that? One half of the pregnancies in the United States of America are terminated by the deliberate murder of the unborn child. I rather doubt, very frankly, if Judah in ancient Jerusalem, before God sent them into the Babylonian captivity, 
was as corrupt and as guilty of innocent blood as we are. Over one and one half million. God says, also in thy skirts is found the blood of the souls of the poor innocents. I have not found it by secret search, but upon all these. We don't hide this. We tell about it in the newspaper. In some cities, I don't know whether they're doing it here or not, but these so-called abortion clinics are there under the auspices of the local tax-supported health association from the county. They have billboards or signs up on their buildings, and they advertise in the local newspapers to get the girls to come in and have their baby killed. This is not happening in some heathen land in far-off Asia or Africa. This is happening in this supposedly civilized Western Christian nation of America. God said he didn't have to search for it. It was right there openly. And just recently they had something down here at the state legislature. I don't know how it was resolved. It's still going to have to go through the courts. But the medical college at one of our largest universities issued the order that every intern and medical student had to assist or perform an abortion before he would be given his diploma and allowed to go into medical practice. In other words, if this goes on through here, and it probably will, and in other states, it will only be a very short time before every new doctor will have to have been guilty of the murder of a baby before he can come out and supposedly try to save your life. Is America guilty of innocent blood? God have mercy upon us. It's happening largely while the church remains silent. The churches of America are saying very little. Verse 35, listen to this. Yet thou sayest, because I am innocent, surely his anger shall turn from me. Behold, I will plead with thee, because thou sayest, I have not sinned. We have millions of Christians in America, people who attend churches, and they say, well, I know this is going on, but it has nothing to do with me. I have not partaken in it. I am not a sinner. That's those other people God is going to judge them. But God already said to us in verse 29, Ye all have transgressed against me, saith the Lord. And here in this verse 35, He in effect says, Because you say you're innocent, I am going to come and judge you. Thou sayest, Because I am innocent, surely his anger shall turn away from me. But God says, Behold, I will plead with thee, because thou sayest, I have not sinned. Now some of you think, well, you have nothing to do with these things, but I would remind you that these medical schools I just mentioned are largely tax-supported. They are supported to some extent with grants from the Health, Education, and Welfare, which gets their money from the taxpayers. If you pay taxes of any kind, and I'm not just talking about income tax, Whenever you buy things in the store, you pay a sales tax. That goes into the state. Part of that state money goes down to this university, which is going to require these medical students to kill a baby before they'll graduate them. We are all guilty of this innocent blood because of what we have allowed to happen here in this nation. That's true of New Testament theology. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And he says there is none righteous. No, not one. Let's be very careful about claiming our own righteousness when we stand before God in the final days of this age. Now turn with me over to Deuteronomy 23. I'm certain there are some listeners who will say, well, I haven't sinned in that. But let's read just a couple other things here in which literally the whole nation is guilty before God of sinning against Him. Deuteronomy 23, verses 19 and 20. Thou shalt not lend upon usury to thy brother, usury of money, usury of victuals, usury of anything that is lent upon usury. 
Unto a stranger thou mayest lend upon usury, but unto thy brother thou shalt not lend upon usury, that the Lord thy God may bless thee in all that thou settest thine hand to in the land whither thou goest to possess it. Have you ever lent money on usury or charged interest for money which you have lent? If so, you have sinned before God. You have violated God's divine principles. And this is part of God's law. Now, I know there are many people who consider themselves quite righteous, who lend money or buy church bonds. They lend money to their own church. I hear these people on the radio all of the time offering people 8% interest if they will buy the church building bonds and such and such a church so we can build this church and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. What happens? Those people lend their money to that church. The minister receives tithes and offerings from the other people and then he has to take part of God's money and give it back to the person who bought the church bond and they spend it upon themselves. They actually spend God's money upon themselves. And many of them would be the first ones to stand up and say, I am innocent. I have not sinned. Deuteronomy 15. Some of these, I'm sure some of the people have never even heard of. Starting in verse 1. At the end of every seven years thou shalt make a release. And this is the manner of the release. Every creditor that lendeth aught unto his neighbor shall release it. He shall not exact it of his neighbor or of his brother, because it is called the Lord's relief. Because it is called the Lord's release. Of a foreigner thou mayest exact it again, but that which is in thine but that which is thine with thy brother, thine hand shall release. Have you ever cancelled a debt after the end of seven years that somebody couldn't pay? Perhaps you have done so personally. But as citizens and taxpayers and property owners in this land, we are all part of a great system of debt, federal debt, state debt, municipal debt, county debt, sewer bond debt, water bond debt, street bonds, highway bonds, mounting into the trillions of dollars, none of which is ever canceled and all of which carries interest. In those things, we are guilty by the very fact we live here and have allowed these things to come to pass. Yes, I'm afraid we are more guilty than Israel was in the days of Jeremiah the prophet. Back to Jeremiah 2. He said, Ye all have transgressed against me. And then in verse 35, Yet thou sayest, Because I am innocent, surely his anger shall turn from me. Behold, I will plead with thee, because thou sayest, I have not sinned. Why gaddest thou about so much to change thy way? Thou also shalt be ashamed of Egypt, as thou wast ashamed of Assyria. They had turned and asked Egypt for help, and they had asked Assyria for help. They went into captivity in Egypt. They later went into captivity in Assyria, and these people were going into Babylon. God says, you're going to be ashamed of this captivity. Well, praise God that the time will come when we will be ashamed that we have allowed ourselves to be taken into captivity under these heathen and alien ideologies of Egypt and Assyria and Babylon. And that's what they are. They have the same source today as they did at the time of Jeremiah. He says in verse 37, Yea, thou shalt go forth from him. In other words, from the captor, from the captivity, and thine hands upon thine head. For the Lord hath rejected thy confidences, and thou shalt not prosper in them. That's quite a posture, isn't it? To come out of captivity ashamed with your hands upon your head. Well, praise God, you can't carry much out of Babylon if you come out of Babylon with your hands upon your heads, can you? I think by implication he's saying you're going to walk out of there with nothing. You're not going to carry anything out of these captivities. And I should add here from a later chapter of Jeremiah, for those who still think that they can fight their way out of this captivity which we are in by fighting our enemies, later on Jeremiah in chapter 37 had this to say to the people in Jerusalem who said they were going to fight the Chaldeans and whip them. 
Just like some say today, well, we're going to fight the communists and whip them. Verse 6 of Jeremiah 37. Then came the word of the Lord unto the prophet Jeremiah, saying, Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, Thus shall ye say to the king of Judah, that sent you unto me to inquire of me, Behold, Pharaoh's army, and they had made an alliance with Egypt to save themselves from Babylon. Behold, Pharaoh's army, which is come forth to help you, shall return to Egypt into their own land. And the Chaldeans shall come again and fight against this city, and take it, and burn it with fire. Thus saith the Lord, Deceive not yourselves, saying, The Chaldeans shall surely depart from us, for they shall not depart. For though ye had smitten the whole army of the Chaldeans that fight against you, and there remain but wounded men among them, yet should they rise up every man in his tent and burn this city with fire. God said, I don't care if you smite and wound every communist in the world. If I have decreed that this nation is going to come against you, even if they're all wounded men, they're going to come and burn this city with fire. That which God has decreed is going to come to pass. The enemy is going to come. Now, our time is up. And that is the base or the foundation of part of Jeremiah's message. The part which we read in Jeremiah 1 and verse 14, where the Lord said unto me, Out of the north an evil shall break forth upon all the inhabitants of the land. Next week, we're going to consider the other thing which God showed Jeremiah in verses 11 and 12 of chapter 1. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Jeremiah, what seest thou? And I said, I see a rod of an almond tree. Then said the Lord unto me, Thou hast well seen, for I will hasten my word to perform it. That's the good news part of Jeremiah's message. We'll consider what the almond tree means next week, God willing. Let's all stand. Our Father and our God, we thank you for these words which thou hast preserved for us down through the ages of thy wisdom and thy warning to this people. We pray that you have mercy upon us. Father, we have sinned. We have done things that our fathers never even dreamed of doing. We pray for thy great name's sake, for thy mercy's sake. Turn us again to thee and have mercy on us in Jesus' name. Amen.